You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello there, listeners. How are you? How are you coping? How are all of you coping? How are you getting on? I hope you're doing okay out there in podcast land. Now, here's a new episode uh, to listen to, obviously. And this time, I'm joined by IELTS teacher Jessica Beck, who you might know from the IELTS Energy podcast and All Ears English. Jessica has been on Luke's English podcast a couple of times before, as you may remember. She's a specialist in IELTS preparation, having taught IELTS courses for many years now, uh, both in classrooms and online. Just in case you don't know as well, IELTS stands for the International English Language Testing System. Um, I recently talked about the speaking part of the IELTS test with Keith O'Hare in episode 640. Um, so IELTS is a proficiency test which reveals a person's English level and it's fiendishly difficult, requiring a lot of preparation in order to make sure that you get the result that reflects your English at its best. So Jessica recently invited me onto an episode of her podcast, that's the IELTS Energy podcast, and we talked about differences between American and British English because the IELTS test features both versions. So it's interesting to compare them and look at the, some of the common vocabulary differences. So that is uh, number 850 of the IELTS Energy podcast. It's called, What's a Zebra Crossing? Luke will tell you. And there's a link on the page for this episode if you'd like to hear it. So that's IELTS Energy podcast episode hundred uh, episode eight hundred and fifty. What's a zebra crossing? Luke uh, Luke will tell you. So um, yes, and if you'd like to know what a zebra crossing is, I mean in America they call it just like what a crosswalk. <laughs> is that a terrible American accent? Probably crosswalk. We call it a, a zebra crossing, pedestrian crossing, and various other types. Anyway, listen to that episode if you want to hear all that stuff. So now Jessica Beck is back on my podcast again in this episode. So here's a little overview of what's coming up in order to help you follow the whole thing. So first, you'll hear some chat about the weather, where we live, which is kind of a tradition on this podcast now. I'm in Paris and she's in Portland, up in the northwest of the USA near Seattle. So this bit of small talk should give you a chance to get used to the speed of the conversation before we move on to talk about the computer-based IELTS test and then other things. So are you planning to take IELTS? Uh, you will need to prepare properly if you are going to take this test. Some of you will be planning to take IELTS uh, in the future and you might be wondering about the best way to prepare, especially if you are studying at home. And if that is you, then you could check out the Three Keys IELTS course, which Jessica and the other girls at All Ears English have created. It's a really solid and complete package, which includes pretty much everything you need to get success in this course, including video lessons, test practice, and 90 minutes of one-to-one -one counselling with one of the girls over Skype. Um, so I suggest that you could check out the personal coach course for the computer-based test. And in fact, listeners to my podcast can get a $50 discount on that, which is nice. Check out teacherluke.co.uk slash three keys for all the information. You'll hear some more details about that later. So there's some chat about the weather, and then we uh, talk about taking the computer-based version of the IELTS test. But it's not all about IELTS this episode. Um, I think we just talk about IELTS for the first 10 minutes, in fact. And then you'll hear us sharing a couple of personal stories about doing things for the first time. Uh, and this is a, a, a PG-rated episode, by the way. You might be thinking, hmm, personal stories about doing things for the first time. Which things would those be, Luke? Well, it's, um, it's family-friendly, this episode. Uh, so don't worry. Uh, not that you were worried. But anyway, carry on, Luke. You, you were doing okay, all right? So anyway, stories about doing things for the first time. One of them involves the importance of not giving up, even when it hurts... Are you still are you sure this is a family friendly episode? I I really am certain. And so that's one story and the other story is about how to deal with the stress of public speaking. So we re we reflect on the lessons learned from those experiences and their relevance to the challenge of learning a language. 
and can you hear my washing machine again? Yes, you, you can if, if I've pointed out. Anyway, so some stories about uh, not giving up and about dealing with stress in public speaking. Um, also, listening to this conversation, you'll also be able to notice differences between Jessica's American English and my British English. Not necessarily in terms of vocabulary used, but more just in terms of things like our intonation patterns or the tone of our speaking in general. It'll probably seem really obvious at the beginning, especially if you are very used to hearing me speak. Listening to this conversation myself and during the conversation, I somehow felt myself to be extra British. You might notice it. The contrast between me and Jessica might be obvious, especially at the beginning. I certainly felt that way. I suddenly felt I was super British, like a bit awkward, maybe even a bit posh, even though I'm not, and quite wordy. Um, And I got the impression that Jessica was being extra American, super enthusiastic, energetic and positive. Um, Actually, we end up making fun of each other's speaking style at one point as we do impressions of each other presenting our podcasts. It's a bit of a laugh and you should enjoy it. But anyway, listen out. You, You may notice some of those differences between me being somehow typically British and Jessica somehow being typically American. Anyway, I'll now stop rambling so that you can actually listen to this conversation with Jessica about IELTS and about what we learnt from the challenge of doing some things for the first time. And I'll talk to you again briefly at the end of the episode. Hello, Jessica. How are you today? Um, I'm happy to be here on your show. I'm super excited. It's it's really nice to have you here. And uh, thank you for inviting me onto your show as well, which uh, happened. Yes. Uh, we recorded that last week. Yes. Oh, my gosh. You'll link to that in on your website somewhere, I will. right? Got- okay, I will. The listeners, the listeners will know how to find it and, and all that stuff. I'll link to cool. it properly. I'll, I'll explain everything. Um, <laughs> that was a super fun episode about American and British vocabulary. Yeah. Very fun. So much, so much uh, to say on that subject. Um, so American and British vocabulary. Well, you're in America. I'm in Britain. Uh, well, you've been on my podcast before. Uh, my listeners will probably remember. But uh, you're over there in Portland, Oregon. How is it over yes. there at this at this moment? It is actually sunny. Still cold. But, shockingly, it's supposed to snow on Saturday, which I don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand it. Snowing in March. (laughs) It's ridiculous. My son's birthday is, like, early April, and it's so tricky trying to plan parties for him. We just do it indoors now every year, because, like, I tried to do it outside a couple times, and you never know here. So, yeah, we spend a lot of time indoors in Portland, Oregon. (laughs) <laughs> yeah because you're kind of up north no, northwestish uh area so yeah it must get pretty cold and freezing there in the winter time but uh summer must be kind of outdoors weather i suppose isn't it oh yeah oh it's gorgeous there's a funny show i don't know if you've seen it called portlandia um listeners you should check it out if you can find it online and they just like make fun of Portland, because, you know, Portland is weird and it's super quirky. Um, But there's this one sketch where they're like um, chasing the sun in Portland and because it's super rainy here. Right. And so they're just like driving all around the city and then they spot like a circle of sunlight in a park and they run over there and set up their chairs. And then like five minutes later, they're like, oh, no. And the sun goes away and they have to like chase it somewhere else. It's anyway, you just have to see it, I guess. It sounds like living in England. That's, that's my whole life you just <laughs> described. And, and now France, where the, in, in Paris, where the weather is exactly the same as it is in London, despite the fact that oh. uh, London's got the bad reputation. But, uh, you know, we live, we live with that. It's the cross that we bear. Huh? <laughs> that's disappointing. I thought, I, I picture, you know, my vision of Paris, of course, is extremely romanticized. I'm sure it's not like that at all. But, <laughs> and I've even been there and I still like hold this like unreal image in my head, just like sunny and walking on the river and, you know, drinking wine and like not working. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's the, that's the French dream. <laughs> that's my dream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what you do. You know a lot of people come to Paris uh, in sort of holiday season when the weather is nice. But we also get dark grey 
rainy winters as well, just like we do in England. But you know, I I don't mind. I I'm I'm, fr- I'm from I'm from the Midlands in England, so if the weather was good all the time, I would it would be really weird for me. So you know, it's normal. Yeah. I like the changes though, because now I'm super like motivated to get outside this summer because I'm so sick of being inside. Yeah. I need the changes. I've lived in tropical countries. You know, I lived in Cambodia and Taiwan and Mexico and been in all these like sort of tropical environments. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I like the seasons. Like I don't want to step outside and immediately sweat for many months of the year. <laughs> like I want to be comfortable. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, well, there you go. Look, we've done the weather. It's a sort of a tradition. I have to talk about the weather at the beginning of, of my conversations on this podcast. So That's cool. <laughs> IELTS Energy, right? IELTS Energy. What is new in the world of IELTS and IELTS Energy? I am so glad you asked. Um, So guys, if you are planning to take the computer test this year, or sorry, the IELTS test this year, um, you should check out if the computer version is available where you live. IELTS started doing computer delivered exams a few years ago, but within the last year, they've really become more common. I think they're easier for test centers to give as well. There are more test dates for the computer version. Um, and I think it's easier. Now, let let me explain real fast. It's not like easier, okay? Like all the questions, all the material, it's, it's the same. It's all exactly the same as the paper version. But the way you take the computer test is easier, I think. So I can I can go into detail there. But before I, exp- I try to convince you guys to take the computer test, um, I have some exciting news from our side of things over at All Ears English. We just released the first computer delivered IELTS course in the world, which is Ooh. huge. Congratulations. Uh, thanks. <laughs> it's it's really cool, you guys. So I actually took the computer test. I went up to Canada last summer and took the test myself so I could like experiment with strategies and figure all the stuff out, right? And then we made a course about it. Um, and it's so good. It has all the three key strategies, everything that works on the paper test that's been proven by thousands of students and just slightly altered, right? To make sure you know all the ins and outs of the computer, like what all the buttons do. Some of the questions are a little bit different, like map labeling. You don't actually label a map like you do on the paper test. You like fill out a table. So there's some slight differences that you do need to know before you go in. And also there's like zero good computer practice out there. I think British Council maybe has like one practice test uh, for the computer delivered version. And that's it. Like there's nothing else. There's no other way you can practice for the computer test unless you're in our course. <laughs> ah, well, there you go. Okay. So do you recommend then taking the computer-based test? I mean, obviously you're talking about your course, but um, what yeah. is what are the advantages of doing the test on a computer rather than doing it on paper? Yeah, for sure. So there are a, a number of advantages, guys. Like for listening, um, you get headphones and you can control the volume. And that's a huge advantage because on the paper delivered test, you can't control what's happening in that room. Like I've heard horror stories from students. Like I just talked to a student yesterday who said that the volume on the speakers was too loud when he took the test. And he like totally missed the first couple answers because you couldn't like decipher what they were saying because it was so like muddled because of the volume. Mm. They adjusted the volume, but because he missed those first couple answers, it just threw him off. Like he still got a seven on listening because he had great strategies and he practiced, but still like it threw him off for the whole listening test. So there's a lot you cannot control on the paper version, but on the computer version, you just put on the headphones, you can adjust the volume at any time. And you can also, this is a cool tip, like just keep the headphones on for the reading test and the writing test as well, just because it helps you focus, right? Mm. You can pretend you're the only one in the room taking that test. You won't get distracted. So yeah, great advantage for listening. 
And then for reading, um, it's a split screen. You have the passage on the left hand side and the questions on the right hand side. So you can just like easily look back and forth, right? Mm. But on the paper test, you're like flipping back and forth between pages and making little notes and whatnot. So I think that makes it easier and faster for the reading test. Plus you have like a timer at the top. So again, like I feel like you're more in control when you take the computer version. That's good. Yeah, because doing the IELTS test is, it's not just a question of English skills. There's also the whole exam skill side of things, which means the challenge of having to deal with the different pages you have in front of you and the kind of uh, approach that you've got to take to doing each task. And so, totally. yeah, and there's, there are lots of factors like knowing how much time you've got left and this, that and the other. And so, yeah, this yeah. sounds like, yeah, you do have a lot more control over all that kind of stuff and you can just focus instead of having to like listen to a tape player and getting distracted and stuff. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. So I'm a huge fan of the computer version, guys. If you just call the local test center, go online, book a test, you can see what's uh, available around you. So if the computer version is available, there are there are more test dates um, every week of the computer version than the paper version as well. Um, And just for the last two sections, so writing, I think, is also better, especially if you're not so great with your handwriting, which a lot of people don't do that all the time now, right? Like, we type all the time. So we type our essays on the computer, and it's a lot faster. There's only one sort of caveat that as we're typing, it is easy to write too much. And it's also easy to make a lot of typos because you start going too fast. And so my only advice there, just like a little warning, still stay within our recommended word limit so you don't write too much. So for task one, still stay under 180 words and task two, stay under 280 words or else like your score is going to go down. Like too many words does not help your score. (laughs) Mm, Yes, exactly. Okay, so can you just give us like a little overview of what's included in your course about the computer-based test? Yeah, so we have um, all the strategies you need for each section of the test. Um, It's called Three Keys IELTS because every strategy is boiled down to three simple steps. I taught in an actual IELTS school in Taiwan for like six years and gosh, like some of the strategies people were teaching were it's confusing, like so confusing, like 10 steps to find an answer or whatever. Um, so everything's boiled down to three simple steps, um, video lectures, practice exercises, all like the computer delivered tests that you'll do, um, answer lectures. And yeah, it's completely supported all the way. Private Facebook group, 24-7 access. It's all the same awesome benefits of our original paper version, except now it's for the computer. <laughs> all right. Okay, that's great. So I'll be telling the listeners exactly how they can get access to the course and find out more information and so on. Here I am, in fact, to tell you a couple of those details. This will only take a minute or two, and then we'll move on to talk about something else. So if you're interested in taking the All Ears English Three Keys IELTS success course for the computer-based test, then they're offering you $50 off. That's a $50 discount for my listeners. And I recommend that you take the personal coach package. You'll see that they've got a few different packages, but the personal coach package looks like the one that I would do if I was in your position. It includes these things. So there's a detailed study plan, which tells you basically exactly what you need to do uh, over either a 30-day period or a 60-day period, depending on uh, you know what you choose. 95 video lessons to help you learn three keys, strategies and templates on listening, reading, writing, speaking and anti-anxiety, which is quite interesting. Progress checks to ask questions after each module, uh, membership of a private Facebook group, as you just heard Jessica mention, a monthly IELTS writing contest, three full practice tests. It's really important that you do uh, practice tests and uh, they provide you with three of them uh, on this course. Plus, you get 90 minutes of personalized one-to-one coaching on Skype with uh, one of the girls. It probably would be Jessica herself. That's 
uh, a 60 minute writing lesson and a 30 minute uh, mock speaking test. And also you get writing feedback and essay scoring on two essays during the coaching. And yes, all of you, my listeners, would get $50 off that course. To get the discount, you need to use my link, which is teacherluke.co.uk slash three keys. And three keys, that's the number three, followed by the word keys, K-E-Y-S, you know, like those things you put indoors to open them. Right, you know what, I, what? What? How many things would you put in a door to open it? It's got it's only a key. How many of them? Three in this case. What are you on about, Luke? Just keep it simple, okay? Anyway, teacherluke.co.uk/slash three the number keys, and that's the URL. Uh, you have to use that URL to get the discount. And uh, yeah, just my website slash three keys. And if you can't remember that URL, then you'll find the link in the show notes for this episode. All right. So yes, a little advert there for their IELTS course, but I uh, do believe that it's a good course. And if you're going to take IELTS and you want to prepare properly, then it would definitely help you. Okay, so let's get back to the conversation now, uh, which is at this point going to focus on a couple of personal stories, like I said in the introduction, and there are a few funny moments coming up. So let's carry on. So this is where we segue into the second part of this conversation you see the way i'm doing it like this that very like, literal that was i'm just like was, now we will segue to another uh topic <laughs> <laughs> now i will move my words to something else <laughs> now i will use words to make us uh talk about a different thing <laughs> wow you're good at this luke <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know. I've been doing this for 11 years and still haven't quite managed the, the smooth kind of radio transitions. Uh, uh, no. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so since this is the first time that you've launched a course about the computer-based test, a uh, very important uh, moment here. <laughs> yes, it shall be remembered throughout history, Luke. That's, that's right. <laughs> Um, this is the first time we've launched a course about the computer-based test. So uh, what, we've, what we're going to do is we've decided to share a couple of stories about the first time that we did something. So it's, mm. it's anecdote time. This is Yay. where we just tell a, few, a couple of uh, <laughs> anecdotes about doing things for the first time. So who wants to go first? Would you like to go first or should I go first? I'll go first. Okay. Um, so guys, I thought about the first time I went snowboarding. Um, and I thought about this because I've been trying to get James, my son, into snowboarding for a couple of years and it hasn't quite worked. It's hard. Like the first time you go snowboarding, the first few times, it's really, really hard and it hurts a lot. So um, the first time I went, Like I'd already been skiing because I grew up in Carson City, Nevada, near Lake Tahoe. And just all the kids are in the ski program, like through elementary school and middle school. It's just a thing. Everybody does it. So I was like, I could I could transition to snowboarding. No problem. (laughs) Um, Because snowboarding is way cooler than skiing, obviously. Mm. Um, So my mom and I went to um, Squaw Valley, like a super nice ski resort. Um, We had like a fancy hotel. We stayed a couple nights there. And I told her I wanted to try snowboarding. So she got me a lesson. The beginner lesson, it was okay, right? Just like on the bunny hill. um, I managed to stay up for more than a minute a couple times. And the lesson ended. I was like, I'm going to tackle that mountain. So I took the ski lift to the top and I just, I basically just fell on my behind and my front. I fell all the ways for like hours. Um, cause like I was so determined to like do this that I stayed out there by myself for hours. And so like that night we're like going to dinner in this fancy restaurant and stuff. I could not sit down. I was like 14 and I had to sit down like a pregnant woman, you know, like, <laughs> like where you put your hands behind you first and then you sit down super slowly. I was like that for days. Um, it just, it, oh God, it was so much pain, but still the next day I was like, I'm going back out there. And just like side note, 
my mom and I saw Henry Winkler, otherwise known as the Fonz, um, just like out skiing. Wait, so- wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> you saw you saw the Fonz on a ski slope. Yeah, he was so adorable. I shouldn't say that, but uh, because he's a short man, but he's adorable. He had like a perfectly clean and crisp white ski suit from like head to toe. And just like it was, you know, he was just stopped talking to his family. Um, And he like nobody was bothering him or anything. But my mom and I both stopped and ogled like, (gasps) Is that really him? Oh my God, that's the Fonz. Yeah. Wait, so so I wonder if all of my listeners know who the Fonz is. I mean, I'm sure that Happy Days was exported around the world as a prime piece of American cultural um, <laughs> imperialism. I don't know, cultural capital. Imperialism? <laughs> well, yeah, soft, think- soft cultural imperialism. I'm joking, of course. <laughs> I'm joking. It's not not really, but uh, no. Does you do you reckon everyone knows who the Fonz is? Probably not. Would I mean, you... this show was out even before you and I were around, right? Like we're um, not that old. I suppose or maybe so. I don't you know. Are. Sort of, yeah, I'm quite old. <laughs> I'm quite old. But I used to watch Happy Days on TV in the 80s and 90s. I think it probably was originally on telly in the 70s, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't even remember. Well, I guess I remember seeing some reruns of it in the 80s. But it's like, yeah, like a late 70s show. Um, wasn't Ron Howard in it? That's right. right? Ron- he was like the main guy. And now he's like this awesome director. Yeah, that's right. Ron Howard yeah. played, um, oh, what? Freaking- Richie? Richie Cunningham. Cunningham. Ah, nice. Cunningham. Richie Cunningham. <laughs> I'd say Cunningham, but Cunningham. Let's- yeah. At some point, Luke, you should like if you have an American guest, just like switch it and do the rest of the episode with you doing an American accent <laughs> and then the other person doing a British. Let's accent. do that now. You're American, right? Uh, no, I come know on. I shouldn't have said that. I don't want to. <laughs> come on, Jessica. Come on. Do an English accent. Come on. Um, the first time I went snowboarding. <laughs> There. How was that? <laughs> Not bad. It's good. Can you do? You, you could do Luke's English podcast. Go on. Let's. I want to hear you do Luke's English podcast. Go on, please. Just do do like the introduction. The introduction to an episode of. My okay. Podcast. All right. Please, okay. Let's try. Hilarious. All right. Welcome to Luke's English podcast. I am your your host, uh, Luke. I am very well spoken, and I do comedy. Thank you for learning English. <laughs> <laughs> what? <on? laughs> Okay. No, that was good. That was fun. But I'm like, uh, I, I imagine in, in your version, in your version I'm, I'm, I'm wearing like a, a, a top hat and a, a yes. monoc- and a monocle. And I'm like, mm, I'm, a, I'm a gentleman <laughs> from the 19th century, don't you know? That's what, that's what British means to Americans. It's yeah. like fancy and serious. <laughs> yeah, that we're all... We're all sort of like in some sort of Victorian era dressing room, like a kind yeah. of Sherlock, like the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes story. Exactly. And we're sitting around smoking pipes and, uh, hmm, <laughs> you know, Mrs. Hudson, another round of drinks, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing, right? <laughs> and everybody lives in a town that ends with, with like, I would say Shire, but it's like Devonshire, blah, blah, sure. Yeah, like yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lest- Leicestershire and there Worcestershire and uh, Gloucester, <laughs> Gloucestershire and other. Okay, places. now you, now you do, now you do me. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Just do like pretend we're on um, IELTS Energy, and then like welcome people to the show. <laughs> <laughs> really, you really want me to do this? Hey, okay. I had to, so yeah. you have to now. All right, I'll do it. Okay, guys, today we've got an amazing <laughs> episode for you guys. <laughs> And uh, we're talking to a real British man. Uh, no, no, that's that's ridiculous. I'm sorry. Oh my god! I hope I don't sound like no, that. No, no, no. You're 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 much better than that. But <laughs> oh, that was really fun. That's a horrible okay. parody. That was fantastic. And, and anyway, right? Let's let's just bring things back down to earth for a second. Yes. So, yes, yes, so yes. you were on a mountain in America. Right. Yes, I was. Yes. And you, you, you uh, with, and you couldn't sit down, but you decided to continue because, like, the previous day of snowboarding had ruined you. And uh, but you decided I, this is too fun. I'm going to go back. And you and your mum went up on the mountain again, and then you saw 
Henry Winkler, a.k.a. Yes. The Fonz, uh, on yes. the ski slope. And, and we're now trying to decide if uh, the people of the world know <laughs> who The Fonz is. Uh, he's obviously a very important figure in our lives because of all the TV yes. shows. But who yes. is The Fonz then? Go. You can, can you explain? Okay, so on Happy Days, guys, that show was about um, some like high school kids, I guess. Richie was in high school, I think. I'm bad. I haven't even seen many episodes. It's just like part, it's such a part of our culture. And mm. so The Fonz was Henry Winkler's character and he was a little older. He was just super cool and he had like, he always wore a black motorcycle jacket and he would like do the finger guns or something at people and be like, yeah, I don't know. He was just cool, guys. So um, now he's like synonymous with cool, right? Yeah. Like it's just a cool character. Um, so even though I have barely seen the show, I still know who the Fonz is. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Like everyone knows who the Fonz is, even if they haven't, say, watched much of the many episodes of the show. And exactly, yeah, he would do that thing where he'd stick his thumbs up and kind of go, hey, like a cool <laughs> guy. And there's the scene in the beginning of the the, the show where – you know, like the opening titles and there's a shot of the Fonz in the toilet and he's, he's looking in the mirror and he's going to comb his hair. And then he realizes, wait a minute, I don't need to comb my hair. I'm cool. Hey, you know, he like <laughs> goes to brush his hair and he's like, wait, not necessary. Totally. I forgot <laughs> about that. Oh my gosh. And just that like greased back, cool hair that I guess was cool in the sixties, seventies. I and, don't know. And Guys, the, I'm sure you could see clips on YouTube. And the Fonz also, I, I, he was he had some magic powers, I believe. What he did, no. like yes, he did when he no. was using when they had the um, what do you call it, the jukebox in the mm-hmm. diner where they used yeah. to hang out. And no one, you know, often the the jukebox would break or uh, other people couldn't use it, and the Fonz would come over and he would just like punch or tap the jukebox and it would work. Oh, right. So he was the only one who could who could make the jukebox work. And it was like a mystery. How does he do this? He's just got magic, cool powers. He can just make the jukebox work. He's just just cool, man. Like, that's it. And like, if we take that sort of like, that was what was cool in the 60s, right? Like black motorcycle jacket, like super like greasy, slick backed hair. (laughs) Um, In the 90s, when I was learning how to snowboard, I thought the coolest thing was like to be super like punk rock, right? Like all my friends were like skaters. And so that's why I wanted to do snowboarding. Um, So guys, I think like the, if the lesson here, if I could, if I could try and extrapolate a lesson, um, if you are motivated, right? Like you, you can do it. Even if it feels like your, like your body is broken or your brain is broken from understanding not understanding english like Mm. if you're motivated that intrinsic sort of motivation you can do it you guys are listening to this podcast right now and understanding most of what we say like you can keep going you just have to find that motivation and i think that's what's that's what's hard right not just learning for a job or a piece of paper but like for yourself so Mm. there's the lesson (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And don't give up because if you had after day one, when you, you were aching all over from the yeah. day snowboarding, if you had decided, oh, no, I'm not going to go out again today. I'm in too much pain. And you'd given up, then you wouldn't have seen the Fonz on a mountain. Exactly, Guys, if you keep studying English, if you don't give up, you will one day meet the Fonz or someone else that you think is really cool that is speaks that, English. <laughs> is, that a guar- is that a guarantee? Like, I promise. That is 100% true. That's right. You'll meet the fawns if you really try. <laughs> Just keep going and eventually the, the, uh, you will meet the fawns. I think that may be, uh, didn't uh, Einstein... Uh, say that like if you just keep like if you keep going forever and ever then like literally everything will happen it's okay that's that's a that's like it's quantum science or something but anyway anyway there it goes don't give up you might meet the fonz there you go that's the lesson from my story now luke what is your story about the first time you did something so the first i've i was thinking which one am i going to do and i i think i'm going to talk about well Jessica, I'm going to let you decide. Shall I do the first time I flew abroad on my own or shall I do the first time I did stand-up comedy? Um, 
Let's do the stand up one. I okay. want to hear that story. Okay. So the first time I ever did stand up and um so if my story rambles around too much, then please ask me questions to help direct me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, stand-up comedy, I think my listeners know what this is because I've talked about it quite a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I, I had been doing this uh, workshop. So I decided, but I thought, I think I would like to try and be funny in front of people. Why did I mm. choose to do that? I don't know because it's a, 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 it's a, a terrifying experience. Actually. Yeah, it must be. Did had you done much public speaking before that? Like, were you okay in front of people, like, besi- like not doing stand up, just like giving a speech or whatever? Uh, yeah, in theory. I mean, I'd been okay. teaching. I'd been teaching for I don't know about ten years when I started. Uh, okay. When I, when it, so, and I had had some moments in class where I had made them laugh. Not that that's the main aim or anything. But I had, uh, like, I had had some days where I'm like, you know what? I might be funny. You know? <laughs> and, and I was like, hmm, is this a wise, you know, should I be pursuing this, this, uh, this feeling of like, hmm, I think maybe I should try to be funny. Because it's sort of a weird feeling. Because sometimes when you're sort of being funny or making people laugh, it's quite odd. You feel a bit exposed. You know, it's, it's yeah. a bit risky. It feels a bit risky because you might make a fool of yourself. Totally. But the payoff to cause that joy and laughter for another person, especially a group of other people, mm. the feel, the satisfaction you feel after that, I would imagine like you, you cannot get that feeling in any other environment. Yes, it's true. You, uh, making a group of people laugh is incredibly rewarding and it does make you feel very good. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's a good, it's not, um, what's the, it's a quite a wholesome sort of thing. It just yeah. makes you feel good and there's no, you don't get a hangover from it or anything. It's just right. good. It's just pure, purely joyful. Um, so, and also I'm being a big fan of comedy. I, I always sort of had aspirations to do something like that, but I just thought, how on earth do they do it? How do these people go up on stage with a microphone and apparently tell stories off the top of their heads and have the whole room laughing? Now there's a lot nice. of technique involved, a lot of experience yeah. and practice that you need to do. So anyway, uh, I decided, right, I know, I'll, maybe I'll do it. And, and um, a girl I was with at the time said to me, you should do this course. And there was like this fairly well-known course among people in London, among comedians. Um, and it was uh, the Logan Murray's Absolute Beginners Comedy Course. I think it's what it was. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically, his promise was, I will get a uh, you know, group of people who've never been on stage to do comedy. I'll get them after a few weeks a few Saturdays with me, mm-hmm. uh, I will, uh, you'll have five minutes and you'll do a showcase gig at the end. So wow. after this course, uh, there's a gig where everyone does their five minutes and they all bring their friends and family. And so the room is completely <laughs> packed. And, uh, so I'd, I'd come, I'd come up with my comedy routine, which was really weird. Um, can I, can I ask you how, um, that writing process was for you? I, I listened to, um, a lot of interviews with comedians like on WTF and I listened to like mm-hmm. all the comedy podcasts and stuff and yeah. the writing process fascinates me. Like, to, like writing out a joke and trying to think about like when it's going to be funny or the timing or right. Was the writing process like hard for you? Yeah, it's, it's really weird because yeah. in a way, as soon as you write it down, it kind of like, it's not funny anymore. Or yeah. you're writing it down and you're thinking, I've got no idea what people are going to think. You know, I don't know if these are the ramblings of a madman or if these <laughs> are genuinely funny things that I'm, I'm putting down. And so that's why stage time and experience is so important because you need to sort of get a sense of what people generally respond to. Sure. Uh, so it's yeah. like really difficult to like, you just have a blank page, right? I'm going to write some funny stuff and then I'm going to have to say it in front of group, a group of people. I've got no idea if it'll be funny, but during the workshop, yes, you work on certain techniques and ideas. Uh, one of the things that, um, that kind of worked for me and it's, it's quite vague. It's quite difficult to explain, but the idea of the afterthoughts. Hmm. So you take a statement. Okay. And then you, you kind of qualify that statement with various other thoughts. You kind of um, apply a certain kind of illogical logic to it. Can you give an example? 
I knew you'd say that, and I'm not going to try. And, <laughs> I'm going to have to think of an example. So, okay, think of a well-known saying. Okay, uh-huh. think of a well-known phrase, like a bit of wisdom. Um, um, don't upset the apple cart. Don't upset the apple cart. Now that is perfect. <laughs> so, listeners, this phrase means basically don't do something that's going to disrupt the situation. Don't cause any trouble. Try not yeah. to cause a fuss. Don't you don't want to upset the apple cart? Okay. For example, if there's a uh, you, you've just arrived at a new company, you've got a new job at this company, and you think that they should maybe make some changes in the company because it would improve the way that the company is working. But because you're new, you don't want to upset the apple cart. You don't want to suggest these changes and then um, you know create a, a problem. Um, so right. that's, that's to a good upset. Example. Yeah, don't upset the apple cart. So, all right. So essentially what you do with this phrase is you'd say, all right, don't upset the apple cart. And then you could maybe do an unless, you know. Oh, uh, okay. You know, so I have no idea what it would be, but it would be like, don't <laughs> upset the apple cart unless. Uh, unless the apple cart's going to fall on your head. Yeah, or don't upset <laughs> the apple cart unless you hate the apple cart. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> Cheesy. Okay, I, know, I understand. I know. Good example. Okay. I mean, these that that's just directly straight off the top of my head. But that's the sort of thinking that you need to get into. Of like, you mm-hmm. take normal something normal, and you kind of put a little twist on it. Yeah. Um, and and then you start to realize there are certain little structures that tend to work. Like, for example, the pull back and reveal, um, which you must be. I guess you're familiar with that. You know, you get a little bit of information, and then you. Uh, you kind of reveal a bit more information about it and then it changes everything. And I've got some examples sure. which are incredibly cheesy and awful and, and not ones <laughs> that I would use. They're extremely cliched. But they are, they're, they're, you know, the classic ones are, you know, uh, I was 20, you know, 28 years old I was at the time, you know, so, and that is a right, big cliche, yeah. but, it, the, you know, you can imagine. So it'd be like, you know, so I was walking down the street uh, with, with um, no, that's it. So, uh, my mum, my my mum was taking me to the doctors, and uh, she, you know I was holding her hand, and uh, I was a bit nervous, and I got so nervous that I, you know, uh, I, you know, I did a poo in my pants, and it was really embarrassing because she had to like, you know, she changed me in the street. It was terrible. Twenty eight years old I was at the time. You know. <laughs> Right. So like, yeah, that, um, the element of surprise that the punchline being a surprise is, is important. Yes. I mean, yeah. those, those are just a couple of little examples. There's also, there, there's many, many different aspects to it, but another, a third one, and before I actually tell the story, I haven't, got this, <laughs> I haven't actually got to the story yet, but a third idea is the idea of switching off your editor, which is something I have talked about on, on my podcast before because it does kind of translate into language learning in a way. So switching off the editor is essentially when you are trying to think of funny ideas, and this is just in the creative process or maybe in, the, in, the, in a performance situation, mm-hmm. uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about funny ideas, there is a little voice in your head, which is like this editor who is saying, yeah. no, but you can't say that. You mustn't do that. Don't make a fool of yourself. That's inappropriate. You know, you, all these, these things that are limiting you and, and uh, blocking um, the creative impulse, okay? So that's perfect for language learners. We talk is. about that on All Ears English, that connection, not perfection, right? Yes, exactly. So, yeah. so switching off the editor is actually extremely liberating and was quite a big deal for me, I, I, I feel. And, and after a few weeks of, after a few Saturdays, it kind of got into my head and I started switching off my editor. And then when I did that, I certainly realized that ideas just came flowing much more easily uh, than when I was con- concerned about, oh no, what I, you know, oh that would be embarrassing, or I, you know, I mustn't make a fool of myself, and, and you kind of let your guard down, and yeah. then it's it's much easier to start coming out with crazy ideas, and in a way, you start at that point jumping into into this space of of kind of like, okay, this is the area where I'm kind of saying stuff that people don't normally say, but that people think. And that's a very yeah. sort of fruitful place for, for comedy. That is a lot of the best stand-up, right? Like being able to um, be honest and say things exactly that nobody would ever say usually, but people feel and experience and also think. And the fact that you're saying this out loud, right, surprises mm. them, takes the power away from their own like 
worry, right? Like I'm yep. the only one. And then they mm-hmm. hear you say it. They're like, oh my God, that's so true. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> to an extent, I mean, it's not just about going up and saying shocking things. Uh, of course. Obviously there's, there's the structures and the, and the, you know, all the different sort of um, co- comic uh, um, techniques that you have to use as well. So anyway, my first gig um, <laughs> just the nerves that I guess the thing I should talk about really is just the, how do you deal with nerves when you're public speaking? And yeah, I mean, we all yeah. have, we've all had that experience of like, I'm going to do some thing in front of everyone and you, you, you start to, well, you know how it feels. How would you describe how that feels, that feeling of nervousness before you're about to do a performance or even a presentation? It is, it's terrifying. It is, it is hot and terrifying. Um, like I used to be really scared to get in front of people before I started teaching. Teaching was what made me a more confident public speaker. Um, yeah. Before that, I remember trying to like give presentations in class and I wouldn't be able to stop laughing. Um, I would have various reactions to prevent me from actually talking. Very sweaty very hot, very like your whole body is just sort of tingly, right? Mm. Like Mm. just all of those stress hormones are flooding through. Yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. Scary. For me, it's sort of those nerves manifest in a sort of physical, um, tension. Like I can't move. uh, What it weirdly, I, my neck would get very tense. Weird. So it's very, yeah, weird. So I, 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 I'd lock up and uh and that's you know i just feel like this guy with no neck like hello everybody just like this stiff robot person yeah uh, i am here to tell you something <laughs> you know uh my name is luke you know it's very weird <laughs> <laughs> that could be a whole different stand-up character uh, there is a whole other character the robot hello <laughs> i am a robot i will tell you funny things and you will laugh <laughs> Now I will begin, you know. Joke number one. Number one. I was uh, walking to school with my mother robot and I was 28 (laughs) years old. Thank you. (laughs) Just skipping the whole like structure of the story. That would be hilarious. Uh, Um, Okay. So before you are about to go on the mm, stage or wherever it was you mm, were, right, doing stand up, you started to lock up again. Yeah, so that like um, that afternoon, because I think it was on a Saturday. That sort of afternoon, I was the, the nerves were creeping in. I was becoming restless, and I found I couldn't relax. And then I, when I was on my way to the venue and I was trying to cross the street, I realised that to, in order to look both ways, I was literally turning my entire body. I I will oh look to gosh. the left. I will look to the right. You know, it was oh really uncomfortable. Gosh. And then I, uh, I've kind of worked out, it's like, no, no, what I've got to do is I've got to get loose. I've got to kind of move and get loose. Yeah. And so I found that as I was waiting to go on and other people were going up and doing their stuff and the room was full, I was at the back and what helped me was to kind of keep moving and, um, and to kind of stretch a little bit. I found that if I, if I adopted a slightly more open body posture, I'm not man-spreading mm. all over the place, but... <laughs> But just opening but like up. making like a conscious effort to yeah. relax your body. So the things that helped were breathing, right? So breathing from the from the stomach or from the diaphragm mm-hmm. and making sure that I was controlling my breathing and not letting my body um not allowing my body to restrict my breathing, but opening up my my chest, opening up my shoulders, uh maybe you know, stretching my arms out a little bit, a bit like mm. when you get up in the morning, you, know, you need to like yeah. stretch and, and stuff. And so I was stretching and trying to breathe from, from my stomach and, uh, and then sort of just focusing on the enjoyment, like thinking this, this should be fun. I'm just going to go and just have yeah. fun. And if it, if, um, if I'm not funny, then it doesn't matter. It's all just, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. And that's these yeah. these strategies though. Like listeners, these are all strategies that maybe maybe you've talked about stuff like this on the show before, Luke, but like all of these things we can employ in daily situations that make us nervous, right? Like yep. being intentional about your thoughts and how you're holding yourself before you enter a situation. Um like even before like taking an IELTS exam, right? You have to speak face to face with an examiner. And I know a lot of students are 
experiencing like what you're talking about, what we're yeah. talking about, that like extreme nervousness. Um, in, in the course in Three Keys IELTS, we have a whole module about anti-anxiety strategies. Because mm. like we it doesn't like maybe you study and you are getting amazing scores before your exam and then you rock up on test day and you're so nervous you can't remember any of the strategies right <laughs> right so like that's a that's a skill getting over anxiety yes absolutely so yeah for me just breathing body posture trying not to let my myself hunch over staying upright uh, not sitting in the corner hugging myself preparing my <laughs> notes but like yeah. trying to stand, trying to stand up, just relax and stuff. And then probably the biggest one, preparation. Preparation yeah. is the most thing, most important thing, um, because uh, you know what's the old saying? Pre- you know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. Huh. <laughs> uh, that true. old chestnut. It's it is true. true. <laughs> <laughs> that old chestnut, exactly. Um, which is true. And for this particular show, I had prepared. I'd, 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 you know practiced the set over and over again uh, i even practiced it in the kitchen in my flat mm-hmm. and then and one day i realized i was cooking practicing my very strange comedy routine and <laughs> there was someone in the in the corridor of my apartment building who uh, waiting for the lift who could hear everything mm-hmm. i was saying and that was That's like awesome. oh 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 god oh whoa oh, god they must think i'm really weird uh, but anyway <laughs> Did so they laugh <laughs> no, I just, I was aware that was, suddenly there was like a dark shape sort of at the, uh, just outside the window where the lift is. And then, uh, and then uh, and I thought, oh, oh, oh God, they've been listening to me. <laughs> what must they, <laughs> what must they, you know, I wanted to open the door and go, it's a comedy routine. It's just right. a comedy routine. I'm practicing for stand up. And they're like, anyway. They that, thought you were crazy. It's yes, fine. Yes. Uh, <laughs> maybe they're right. I don't know. And <laughs> Um, but preparation. So I, pr- I practiced, I practiced and I'd even videoed myself, uh, uh, doing it because again, practice listeners, if you're going to do a presentation, don't practice like this. This is what you should not do. Write everything down word for word on paper, and then just read your script out loud again and again and memorize it. No, try not to do that. Instead, what you need to try and do is recreate the conditions in which you're going to be doing your presentation so that yeah. and and I would say don't even do it in the mirror. A lot of people assume that you've got to stand there and look at yourself in the mirror. Don't do that either, because when you're doing your presentation or your performance, you're not going to be able to see yourself. True. In fact, you need to sort of forget about yourself. Try not to be yeah. self-conscious. Instead, focus on just communicating specifically the ideas which you have come up with. And I mean, I wrote, I had my routine word for word planned out in advance, but I practiced delivering it. Um, in a in you know in a sort of natural spontaneous way, and it helped. It helped a lot. The 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 the, the gig went well. People laughed um, <laughs> throughout the five minutes. I'm I'm very glad to say. Thankfully, I've had other gigs. Other gigs since were complete disasters, but this first <laughs> one was a success. So I'm I'm very um I'm I'm, awesome. I'm very yeah I'm very happy that it, it went well. So preparation, trying trying to breathe trying to sort of open out your body a little bit in advance, those things helped me to to deal with the nerves. Yeah, I think those are those are really good tips though. Just like that a balance between preparation and relaxation, right? Like striking that balance is tricky, guys, but you do need both of those things before you're going to do a presentation at work, before you're going to take an exam. Um, we, we like on the IELTS Energy, we talk about a lot like controlling what you can so you can let go of stuff you can't control, right? Like it is a tricky balance, but recognize what you can control, which is you can practice, you can uh, you can put yourself in the same and recreate the circumstances you'll have to speak in as much as possible. Mm. Or if you're taking a test, like don't, don't take the practice test at home on your bed, like comfy with like your mom bringing you cookies or whatever. Like that's, <laughs> you know, like, no, <laughs> not mm. like test day. Like actually go to a busy cafe or whatever, where there's lots of distractions and it might yes. be even more difficult or noisy than the, than the test room. Um, like b- challenge yourself. Right. Mm. I think a lot of, um, the lessons from both of our stories about first time and eventually succeeding is just like, 
you you have to take risks, right? Like yes. that's what life is about and learning language more than anything. If you don't take risks and push yourself in learning a language, then you're you're never going to experience that that growth or that that satisfaction of connecting with a native speaker, making them laugh perhaps. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. You can push yourself out of your comfort zone in the preparation stage because then when it comes to the crunch um, you're, you'll be, you know, more prepared, uh, f- for those difficult conditions. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Jessica, thank you very much for talking to us on the podcast again. It's been lots of fun. My pleasure. It was super fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So listeners, if you have any IELTS questions, ask Luke and then maybe he'll have me on again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. But, you know, if you are taking IELTS in the next six months, do check out Three Keys IELTS, guys. Um, I was an, an IELTS examiner for 14 years. So everything in the course is directly connected to the scoring system. Um, computer, paper, general, academic, we have whatever course you need for IELTS, we are the ones that have it. All right. There you go. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Great. uh, Sorry. That's just my, that's just my British sensibility. I can't help being right. Well, there you go. That's it. (laughs) Don't expect, don't expect too much. It'll probably rain tomorrow. You know, that's (laughs) generations of, and generations and generations of, (laughs) People like me just living <laughs> under gray skies. It just makes you like this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. Oh, that's so funny. Well, you know, we do like part of evolution is what like our experience in life or trauma or whatever. It does like change <laughs> our genes, right? And you pass those on. So yeah, yeah you have generations of uh, negativity to overcome, I guess. I, I, well, generations of, of uh, vitamin D deficiency, yes. um, uh, which that's I think it's thing. probably just... Uh, yes I know. <laughs> anyway all right well, thank you for having me on <laughs> you're welcome jessica it's uh, lots of fun and uh yes yeah, speak to you again soon and have a have a fantastic day over there in uh, portland and i hope the weather improves soon and yeah. that you, that you don't get snowed in or anything oh well yeah i hope uh i hope you see some sun too <laughs> <laughs> yes i will i'm sure okay all right well have a good day thanks you too bye yes. bye Right. So thanks again to Jessica for coming on the podcast and sharing that story. I can't believe she actually saw the Fonz on a ski slope. That doesn't happen every day, does it? I'm I'm actually genuinely curious to see if any of you actually know who the Fonz is or Fonzy or the Fonz as he is known um, to his friends and to everyone. Um, He's mentioned the Fonz, is actually mentioned in the film Pulp Fiction, the Quentin Tarantino film from 1994. There, yeah, do you remember that? The scene in the diner near the end of the film with Samuel L. Jackson, Tim Roth, Amanda Plummer and John Travolta. There's a kind of Mexican standoff. Of course there is. It's a Quentin Tarantino film. And if you don't know what a Mexican standoff is, it's basically when loads of people point guns at each other in a film. And maybe in real life, I don't know. But anyway, it's like, you know, at the end of a lot of Quentin Tarantino's films, there's a scene where they're all pointing guns at each other and different people are pointing guns at different people. Ah, how are we going to get out of this situation? So, uh, yes, this scene in Pulp Fiction, there's a Mexican standoff. And anyway, Samuel L. Jackson manages to kind of control the situation. He manages to make Amanda Plummer's character calm down by saying something like this. He says something like, we're going to be like three little Fonzies here, okay? And what's Fonzie like? What's Fonzie like? And she's like, uh, what, what, what? And he's like, what's Fonzie like? And he, she's like, uh, he's cool. That's right, he's cool. So we're going to be like three little Fonzies here, okay? It is a memorable moment, if you remember it, that is. But it just goes to show that, like, everyone knows who Fonzie is, and everyone knows that basically he's cool, so it was quite interesting, I suppose, for Jessica to see this normally cool person dressed in like a some sort of all white uh, uh, skiing outfit on a ski slope. Um, hmm. So I'm actually going to, I found that clip from Pulp Fiction. I'm going to play it to you now. Maybe this will either jog your memory or just at least give you an idea of what I'm talking about so that 
you realise that the you know this is not just the ramblings of a madman. I am talking about something that actually happened in a real film. So here is that scene. Imagine a diner. Amanda Plummer's character is standing on a table. She's pointing a gun at Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson is sitting uh, on one of the seats and he's got Tim Roth. He's holding Tim Roth's arm. He's pointing a gun at Tim Roth. Tim Roth's pointing a gun at him. Everyone's pointing guns at each other. And Samuel L. Jackson cools everyone down by saying, we're going to be like three little Fonzies. All right, now tell her it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Promise her. I promise. Tell her to chill. Just chill out, honey bunny. All right, now tell me your name. Yolanda. All right, now Yolanda. We're not going to do anything stupid, are we? Don't you hurt him. Nobody's going to hurt anybody. We're all going to be like three little Fonzies here. And what's Fonzie like? Come on, Yolanda, what's Fonzie like? It's cool. What? Cool. Correct the mundo. And that's what we're going to be. We're going to be cool. All right, so there you go. You see, not the ramblings of a madman, something that actually happened in a a real film. So, all right, anyway, um, back to reality. If you are considering preparing for IELTS and you have, say, I don't know, 30 or 60 days available ahead of you, then you might consider the Three Keys IELTS Personal Coach course for the computer test. And if you're interested, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash three keys to get a $50 discount. All right then, so how are you doing? How are you holding up? It's a tough and weird time. There's no doubt about it. As I've said before, this virus, you know, there's a virus going around. Did you know about that? Yeah. This virus isn't just a threat to your physical health. Obviously, you need to take steps to avoid catching it, but also to avoid spreading it too. But at the same time, please do look after your mental health. Being isolated, being kind of um, contained at home might, uh, you know, might kind of be a bit weird and it could be tough. So keep yourself busy. Find a routine in your daily life. Do some indoor exercise. You've got to keep doing physical exercise, maybe stuff like yoga. There's plenty of yoga instructional videos on on the Internet and stuff. Uh, Read books. It's always a healthy thing to do. Don't spend the the whole day just staring at social media or watching 24-hour news. Use this as a chance to get some things done that you've been putting off for a while. Keep in touch with friends and family. Just a few ideas. I mean, just a few thoughts. I mean, what do I know? In any case, do take care of yourselves out there, and I hope that this podcast can keep you company just a little bit during this weird time. I should be uploading more episodes just like like normal, really. I'm recording this currently at, uh, well, half past midnight, Saturday night into Sunday morning. But it's okay. I'm going to go to bed in a minute and I'll get a good night's sleep. So anyway, more podcasts will come, hopefully uh, like normal, okay? Except recorded it at midnight when I probably should be in bed. But that's fine. It's a strange time. And when the, what is it, when uh, things get weird, the weird turn pro. Ah, that's a Hunter S. Thompson quote for you to think about (laughs) or not, or just forget instantly. It's up to you. Anyway, I'll speak to you again soon. But for now, goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.